Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, just everybody's getting settled, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm Marty Bauman, the PCOB's uh, Chief Auditor and Director of Professional Standards. Um, I'd like to welcome members of the SAG and official observers to this meeting of the PCOB's uh, Standing Advisory Group. I'd also like to welcome those others attending and observing here and uh, those observing uh, or attending via our webcast. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, probably at every meeting, the Standing Advisory Group is an incredibly valuable resource to the PCOB, and we're truly grateful for the time that you commit to these meetings, the energy that you bring to the meetings, and the comments and input that you share with us during these meetings. As always, I want to, to reemphasize that we welcome and strongly encourage SAG member comments and questions throughout the meeting, and as a reminder, just place your uh, tent card up on its edge whenever you want to uh, comment, and we uh, will recognize you. We generally recognize uh, cards uh, in the order in which they go up, but if you feel that you have a comment that you want to make that's particularly pertinent to the last comment that was just made, or, or somebody's responding to your comment and you want to uh, comment back, just you know, wave your hand and we'll understand that you have a more urgent comment that you'd like to make, and we'll recognize you in that fashion. We previously distributed the agenda and reading materials for the meeting so that you're able to prepare for the topics uh, planned for discussion uh, over the next two days. Uh, in your folders, you have a lot of those materials, including the agenda for the meeting. Uh, also included in, the, in your folders um, are the standard-setting standard agenda as of March 31, 2016. I'll be going over standard-setting in just a few minutes, and information about all the members of the SAG and the official observers. Uh, we used to uh, go around the room and let everybody introduce themselves, but now we put that information in the folder, so we, otherwise we'd need a break after the introductions, given the a number of people around the table. Um, uh, let me take a moment or two just to go over the agenda that we'll be covering for the next couple of days. Uh, shortly, uh, Chairman Doty will provide an update on developments at the PCOB. Although the role of the SAG is to really assist the board in its standard-setting responsibilities, Jim's update, as usual, will cover all aspects of the board's activities. After Jim's comments, please feel free to inquire about any of the matters Jim discusses or, or other general questions you might have about board activities. After Jim's comments, as the agenda, in, agenda indicates, uh, I'll give an update on our standard setting matters. Uh, quite a number of uh, proposals have recently come out, uh, and we want to talk about those as well as the other projects we're working on. <coughs> We've also talked in the past about our standard setting process review, and I'll give some comments about the process review itself and, and the status of that. Um, after a break, um, the team will talk about a recent proposal of, on the auditor's reporting model. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to see that. That's a very important development. It's a re-proposal. We originally proposed that in 2013. Um, after lunch, we're going to continue our dialogue about emerging issues, and I'll talk more about our, in that in our standard setting process and the importance of the <coughs> SAG's input about emerging issues to our standard setting process. So that's a very important dialogue that we began last November uh, with a separate SAG presentation of emerging issues, and we'll continue that discussion today. Uh, Arnold Schilder is here, and Arnold's uh, an observer to the SAG, and is going to give us an update on the many activities at the IAASB, uh, including some of the activities that we're participating in uh, jointly with, with Arnold. Um, a key topic uh, for today and into tomorrow will be a discussion of company performance measures and the role of the auditor. As the briefing paper indicated, we're including in company performance measures both those non-GAAP measures that are getting a lot of attention in the press and, and the use of those, of those measures by, by companies, as well as other measures, operating statistics that companies uh, so often put into their press releases and other information that is such important market driving information. And we'll talk a little bit about what the role of the auditor could or should be with respect to the company performance measures, including in breakout sessions where we'll have a, a chance to really explore those issues in depth. And then the breakout sessions will report back tomorrow morning about uh, the findings of the different groups about those measures and the role of, of the auditor. And we'll talk a little bit more about it when we get to that session. Uh, tomorrow morning we'll also, as we've previously announced, uh, we're looking at the 
the role of the SAG in, in our standard setting process and the effectiveness of, of the SAG, and, and we'll talk about that SAG effectiveness review that's, that's taking place. And we'll wrap up with a discussion of another proposal we recently issued, and that is on the role of the lead auditor with respect to other auditors that participate in audits, uh, mostly in the major multinational audits, for instance, where many other accounting firms participate. And this standard that's proposed is to increase and improve the lead auditor's oversight of those many other auditors uh, to enhance audit quality. So that's a very busy agenda for the uh, next uh, day and a half, and we look forward to your participation in, in all of those topics. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, please raise your tent cards early and often throughout this session with your questions and comments. Your input is, is very, very important to us. Uh, with that, I'd like to, oh, sorry. With, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to our chairman in a second, but I uh, wanna express the disclaimer for all the speakers here over the next uh, day and a half from the PCOB that the views expressed by each of the presenters are their own personal views and not, ne not necessarily those of the PCOB members of the board, or the PCOB staff. With that, it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Chairman Doty for his update. Thank you, Marty. Um, I've got some nuggets and factoids at the end and some Q&A as we normally do, so uh, I'll hit a few high points uh, while you finish up breakfast. As Marty mentioned, uh, we issued a final rule on audit transparency in December, uh, which the SEC approved last week. Investors can now look forward to new disclosures, on the identity of the engagement partner beginning in February 2017 and on other firms that participated in the audit in July 2017. Uh, the board also proposed two significant new standards. First in March, uh, a new standard on procedures for the use of other auditors. Comments are due June 30, 2016. In addition, last week, the board issued a revised proposal on the form and content of the audit report. Comments due August 15, and there's more to come, and I touch these merely to say how proud I am of the uh, Office of the Chief Auditor, uh, the cooperation and collaboration that has been shown by all of our offices and divisions, and especially the support and the collaboration of our colleagues at the SEC, without whom we could not have done any of this. Uh, staff in the Office of the Chief Auditor have been experimenting with new processes to make the standard setting effort overall more efficient to find opportunities to use data from our oversight activities more effectively, more on that later. Economists from the Center for Economic Analysis are becoming more ingrained in the standard setting process daily. They're going forward with robust economic analysis uh, that will be integrated into the projects from the outset, big change. We're also increasing our outreach efforts on projects to obtain pertinent information from investors, auditors, and others. Uh, this starts, as Marty alluded to, with a, a formal environmental scan of emerging issues. Uh, we commenced that with you in a session last November. It's part of the uh, intellectual product of the Standing Advisory Group, and we'll be talking more about it. Marty and his team is going to provide in-depth updates on standard setting um, and a project-specific performance, but I want to note the fact um, that the proposal that we issued last week on the audit reporting model uh, has a new twist, a new, a new feature. We offered uh, a webinar on technical aspects of that proposal and our proposal on other auditors. Uh, a techie webinar, a tech introduction is a good idea. Um, it was something, again, that was uh, boiled up in the SAG meetings, and uh, we hope that that's going to be useful to you. At lunch, uh, the environmental scan will be a topic, but also uh, after lunch, we're going to hear from my friend and colleague Arnold Schilder, of the IWASB and our interaction with the IWASB, which is always uh, very useful and pertinent for these meetings. Uh, we're going to have a deep dive on some pressing issues that many of you raised in November, uh, the proliferation of non-GAAP measures and the implications for the audit that uh, stretch across SEC concerns that involve uh, the FASB and that um, have the attention of many people around this table or something you expressed an interest in. And we're going to take advantage of the size of this group the expertise that we have from diverse professional backgrounds assembled here and will hold these multiple simultaneous conversations and a breakout that we think will be, as usual, very useful. Um, supervision of other auditors, I look forward to hearing that discussion too. But Let me say a word about inspections. I want to touch on the three big 
areas of the uh, board's activities outside of the standards. Uh, we recently commenced the 2016 inspection cycle. Our division uh, of registration and inspections is going to examine portions of more than 275 audits at the six U.S. firms that are members of the GNF, the global uh, networks. More than 275 audits in those global network firms, and then 160 other engagements by the non-U.S. affiliate members of those firms. Uh, that's roughly commensurate with last year, but it, we, uh, I think it's often forgotten how much work goes into oversight and to uh, inspection of the global networks. But we also will look at approximately 400 audits conducted by 160 smaller unaffiliated firms here and abroad that are on a triennial cycle. Again, roughly consistent with 2016, or 2015 rather. We'll use the results of these together with other procedures focused on the internal monitoring processes to evaluate the effectiveness of firms' quality control over the production of audits. Empirical research by our CEA, our economic analysis, uh, is beginning to show signs that both auditors and client issuers strongly react to the issuance of a part one finding on their engagement. The more audits we examine, the more auditors we are able to touch. The touches change behavior. This we know. It supports the firm's efforts to implement quality control, to implement new procedures. We have an expert staff. When they come around, when they inspect the audit engagement file, when they interact with the audit teams, it shows. It shows in the engagement team, in the office, there's a spillover effect that we know occurs. There are indications from the research that, on the other hand, when auditors think that their engagements are not likely to be reviewed, there may be a decline in audit effort the next year, as well as a statistically significant probability of restatement. It's amazing what the, the real data shows here. That's why I believe we need to add some element of randomness, of unpredictability to our inspections. The firms are becoming very good at knowing where we're going and what we're looking for and doing something about it. That's good. That we want. But recently, the staff has issued a brief, an inspection brief, that shows inspection findings coming down modestly but remaining significant. This tells me that we need to maintain vigilance in examining areas of identified risk in the engagement files. The increased use of aggressive non-GAAP metrics that we'll discuss later makes one question, it makes me question, whether management's under pressure to report positive news aren't also pushing the edges of appropriate GAAP reporting in some instances. But to obtain the full benefit of the inspections and to employ the significant expertise that we have in the, in the Division of Inspections and to reduce the risk of sliding back on the improvements we've achieved, we need to introduce an element of surprise. People need to, to uh, think that it's a reasonable possibility that we will show up when they haven't been prepared. I believe that regression to a complete self-regulatory system is not in the interest of the profession for this reason. Randomization and improved risk selection together should allow us to go more deeply into where phenomena such as aggressive use of non-GAAP metrics may well indicate GAAP violations that are being tolerated by loose adherence to audit standards. This requires some lifting of our sights and some changing of our techniques. Economists and statisticians are working with our inspectors now to figure out how we can do this in the most cost-effective way possible. Let me say a word about internal control to bring you up to date from November. Inspection staff have continued to identify deficiencies in audits of internal control, although the level of findings in this area is on the decline. It goes to what we said before. As we discussed in November, some issuers have expressed concerns about the effect of inspections in this area, some issuers, about the effect of our inspections on the audit of internal controls. Well, in the intervening months since we last met, with the cooperation, the coordination, the close coordination and collaboration with our colleagues at the SEC, we've continued our conversations with parties, issuers, and preparers to listen to their concerns and consider how to improve communication and audit quality in this area. The firms have also been both willing and helpful and responsive participants. These have been useful discussions, we think. We want to continue to, to pursue this as long as we can see that the discussions, the meeting of the meetings of issuers and preparers, preparers on the one hand and auditors on the other on this subject 
of how internal control is audited and documented can continue to be useful to the parties. We continue to develop our broker-dealer auditor oversight. The 2015 and, uh, 2016 inspection cycle is in progress, and we're going to look at 75 firms and portions of 115 broker-dealer audit attest, attest engagements in this area. That's consistent with 2015. We continue to find high levels of independence violations and audit deficiencies across all types of audit firms in audit and attest for brokers and dealers, for brokers and dealers. We're taking our four cycles of experience, examining these audits into account as we develop a proposal for the scope and frequency of inspections in a permanent program, and we hope to have that proposal out later this year. Economic analysis. Um, considerable time has been devoted in the Center for Economic Analysis to analyzing potential economic effects of the recently issued new rule on transparency and on the proposals for supervising other auditors and expanding the auditor's report, as well as other standard-setting projects in development. But you'll be able to read that. When you see these releases, you will see a much more substantive economic analysis in those proposals and rules. We also have kicked off a post-implementation review program, starting with AS7, our audit standard on audit quality engagement, our, our engagement quality review. The standard on EQR was expressly required by Sarbanes-Oxley in order to improve on and replace the profession's con concurring partner requirements. In April, the center published a request for comment on how engagement quality reviews have worked, whether they've made a difference. Concurrently with this work, the Center for Economic Analysis is examining, whether the, examining the existing literature and organizing and analyzing data on these reviews gathered through the inspector's process. Center fellows continue to conduct economic research on issues of direct relevance to the PCAOB. Uh, Cutting-edge empirical skills are being brought to bear uh, on our deliberations on policy. Um, in the first 18 months of the center's uh, operation, five working papers have been developed, and they can be found on our website as well as on the Social Sciences Research Network. And for general audiences, there are also summaries of the work on the center's web page. But post-implementation review, PIR, as we refer to it internally, is truly a groundbreaking uh, effort for an agency such as ours or an entity such as ours. It's the start, I think, of a new era in financial services regulation. Uh, I think of John McConnick's uh, term in his uh, new book, uh, The New Geometry of Regulation. Um, randomization plus post-implementation post review, I think, are harbingers of the new geometry in financial services regulation. Enforcement. Several contested matters are working their way through the process. Uh, as you know, by law, we don't announce our enforcement proceedings unless and until a settlement is reached or a party has led, had an opportunity to appeal a sanction to the SEC and the SEC has lifted the statutory stay on the sanctions taking effect. Last year was an active year for the enforcement program. A public, uh, a, a record, making public a record of 44 settled disciplinary proceedings in 2015, 44 settled orders, revealing uh, sanctions on auditors that range from censures to monetary penalties to revocation of registration, bars on association with re registered accounting firms. In 2015, the board determined for the first time not to commence disciplinary action against an audit firm based on the credit given for the firm's extraordinary cooperation with the PCAOB, including self-reporting and remedial actions under the terms of a policy statement that was issued by the board in April 2013. Also last year, the board issued its first order in which a settling respondent admitted to a disciplinary order's facts, findings, and violations. All prior board settled orders had noted the settling respondents neither admitted nor denied. These are going to be carefully selected cases, carefully selected, but there will be cases in which the board will be prepared to litigate and uh, hanging tough, simply hanging tough, may not avail a respondent. So we believe there are going to be cases coming down the road in which in sufficiently egregious cases, respondents will be well advised to, to admit the facts and the violations. Um, we've stepped up in enforcing compliance with audit standards by registered non-U.S. firms. There's a thematic continuity here that you can note. We have just uh, issued a staff audit practice alert on the improper alteration 
of audit documentation. All of you know that it's an absolute no-no to audit documentation when the uh, intention is to, uh, to divert the attention of our inspection staff and when the uh, alteration or the, and the enhancement of the file is not disclosed and documented. Recently, we uncovered evidence that registered firms, including some affiliates from large uh, networks, improperly deleted, added to, or altered documents to PCAOB inspectors before handing them over to PCOB inspectors without informing the inspectors of the alterations and addressing these matters continues to be a high priority for the division. In all of this, we coordinate closely with the SEC's Division of Enforcement, including the mutual efforts to uh, leverage data and analysis to allocate enforcement resources effectively. Um, some other areas, uh, outreach to audit committees continues. Uh, the board issued a report on observations related, relating to our rules and communica on communications with audit committees, AS16, uh, based on the hard work and diplomacy of our Office of International Affairs. We inspect in 47 non-U.S. countries. We're working on number 48 as we sit here, including through joint inspections with the local regulator in 18 of those countries. We've concluded 13 bilateral cooperative agreements in Europe. We're closing the gap on access to access to inspect it in a handful of remaining European jurisdictions where there are registered firms we need to inspect, Belgium, Ireland, and Portugal being the most prominent outliers, but we're working on the arrangements there. At the same time, we are optimistic that the European Commission's 2013 adequacy determination will be renewed later this year, and this will allow our work with local regulators in Europe to continue and deepen. Our Office of International Affairs is working closely with our enforcement division in light of the increase in enforcement matters relating to non-U.S. firms, and this has led to more opportunities for cooperation with other regulators in a much broader and different context than inspections, and to building new relations that help our enforcement efforts. And we have noticed the interest building in certain quarters by, by our counterparts abroad as enforcement uh, becomes a, a priority for them. We continue our efforts to negotiate access to inspect registered firms in China, we continue to enjoy the strong support of the SEC and the United States Treasury Department, both in pressing for access and in standing firm on the basic investment protections that are undergirding our processes. And while I can provide no assurance that we will be ultimately successful, we continue to be in close contact with our counterparts in China, and we continue to make these points clearly. Uh, we will continue to evaluate audit quality indicators and monitor auditors and audit committees' experimentation with them. What we have taken away from here, I think, is a clear description of our job. Our job is to continue to look at a changing landscape, to see what is happening in this area, to evaluate the potential and the risks that go with the, uh, with the development and the acceptance of audit quality indicator schema, and then to publish what we're seeing, but to publish when we have real information and real insights. So this is an ongoing investigation and um, an exciting one from us for us, and it comes out in, in large part of the deliberations of the Standing Advisory Group. That's all I have, and um, I will sit back and uh, receive questions or listen with interest. Ken Golden. Um, just, a, just a couple of thoughts that I've been thinking about, and others have actually suggested to me. I think it might be helpful, at least for me, if not for others in this group, to somehow or another see a summary of what you're finding in these inspections, uh, and, and so we can get a sense of uh, what, what it, what's really going on out there, uh, what are the issues that you're seeing. I, I heard you talk about some of them. Um, but, you know, it's not clear to me what really is coming about. Uh, clearly, we can also read a lot of the reports you send out, but I, I wonder if you can come about and summarize. And then, when I was giving a presentation over this past weekend, I was talking to someone that, and he suggested, uh, I, he asked, he actually wondered how many of the partners in, in the auditing firms read these inspections and were aware of the issues you're finding, and so the, how much do you promulgate what the findings are, remedial, remedial actions are, in summary. So, you know, maybe it's the, what I'm suggesting makes, doesn't make a lot of sense, but I, I, I at least know for myself it would be good to get a summary, and I, and I see actually daily 
sometimes a, a quick summary of some of the inspection and enforcement reports. But to get a real sense of what's going on, how's it changed, what are you finding, how's it evolved, what, what, what things should be, uh, everyone should be thinking about, I don't know, might be helpful. So anyway, that's just a thought. Well, um, the inspection briefs are a work in process. And they're intended in part to, to address that. But your comment is a very good one here because what you suggested is something that we should that we should fit with that and we should take account of what you're looking for when we're thinking about inspection briefs. We're overdue on another audit committee dialogue which which could summarize and synthesize. And our effort, I think, is going to be to, to try to select meaningful analytical conclusions out of what the data is showing and summarize those in a way that, that audit committee members and uh, preparers can understand. And that's, that's more than um, that's more than simply lists of facts. In other words, that the challenge is to, is to synthesize out of what the inspection division knows what you would want. And this is the kind of thing we could do with a little bit of an editorial board, a very informal, um, an informal ad hoc editorial board to, to keep collecting um, a sense of that and putting it out. So that's the, that's the external side. On the, on the internal side, um, I don't think we uh, I don't think we know how many partners or how many firms are paying attention to what we're doing. I mean, this is you raise another interesting point. I think we know that there are a lot of partners in a number of big firms that are acutely interested in what we're doing, and our research tells us that the as I mentioned that the effects of, of a firm knowing it has been. Uh, that its partners have been focused on in a certain area and that there have been findings does have a behavioral effect. But it could be that, there, that uh, surveys could be done of how this information trickles through or, dis or moves through, ripples through um, a firm staff. That's, uh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, it would suggest to that's me that's it's not being promulgated that. very far through these firms. Again, I don't know if that's anecdotal information or not but that, you know, the partners of many of these firms really don't pay attention to the findings. Because that's what I was told. You know, I, I think, um, I don't believe that. I think a lot of partners pay attention to it. I think they really don't want, there are many, many fine audit partners that wouldn't want anyone to think they didn't do a less than a first-class job. Anyway, see, but, but in addition to that, I mean, I think our findings are, um, are a source of anxiety. Uh, within many of the firms for many of the partners. But if it's not universal, what your, your, your point is taken here, that if, if in fact there's any doubt about that, the last thing we want to do is to remove the imminent likelihood, I use likelihood instead of threat, the imminent likelihood of an inspection. And it seems to me that what I, what I think would be an, uh, an optimal inspection regime would be that every partner and every senior manager in every major audit firm thought that within a three to five year period there was a reasonable prospect that their work would be looked at. Now that's a resource question, it's a budget question. I don't, I don't suggest that you expand the inspection division, double it to do that. I just say that I think your, your psycholo the, the psychological your point you're, um, you're making is one on which we have a common view. I wondered if any of the uh, audit firm representatives wanted to give some indication to some of the SAG members of how you communicate the inspection findings maybe throughout the firm if that's useful to uh, respond to that. But I leave that up to you to think about that while I go to the next uh, question. Uh, Chuck, uh, David, are you ready to talk to that? Well, I, I think it's a really good question, an important one. I, mean, I feel pretty comfortable that our partners and our practice understand inspection findings. We go to great length to discuss them, match them back to our guidance, try to identify any opportunities for mediation. And I think another important point here too, and um, I think one of the PCOB board members uh, raised this in a speech more recently, is thinking about firms' quality control systems, right? So as part of that, the firm has a responsibility to both plan, monitor, remediate, and also including root cause. So anytime we are finding deficiencies, uh, that are there, we are taking a very proactive approach in taking a look at what opportunities we have to continue to improve, whether those specific target improvements are taking hold in terms of specific monitoring, and then if they're not, continue to remediate until we're satisfied that they've been sufficiently eradicated um, here. So 
Um, I, I think could there be a partner or could there be an individual that's out there that may not have a complete picture of things? Sure. But I think in terms of messaging from the top and the messaging down consistently and also just in different mechanisms to make sure that people do get the message, I think there is a really concerted effort on that front. To, to be clear, what I meant to convey is that I believe that um, our inspection efforts should in fact confirm and support the judgment of firm managers in, in sort of projecting through the firm their own vision of, of uh, high quality. It's, it's a rock on which the firms can stand, the, the management can stand. Dave, did you want to share, Dave Middendorf, did you want yeah, to share some I, thoughts in terms of uh, yeah, thanks, how Mark. the firms react and how, how well it's communicated throughout the firm? Yeah, thanks, Marty, and I, I would agree with uh, David's comments. Uh, to Chairman Doty's point on the stress uh, in the system, I think our partners and certainly our firm take very seriously the inspection process by the PCAOB, and it is a area of stress, uh, whether it's external inspections by the PCAOB or our own internal quality control inspections. Probably some of the most stressful things our people go through. Uh, it is a reason some people leave our profession because they just don't uh, like that stress, but I think ultimately it does drive the right behavior uh, for our people that they get it, they respect the uh, results of the process, uh, and they want to learn from it and get better. So I think uh, you know we, we certainly value the inspection process, once again, both the external and internal inspections that we do. And we've learned over the last 10 years or so of the PCAOB, I think our quality certainly within, in our firm and I think within our profession have improved uh, from that uh, and will continue to improve. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Chuck Senator, your card's been up. Um, <clears throat> I trust that I'm not alone in this sentiment, um, but one of the things that struck me about the, about the chairman's remarks that there was one element that kind of um, you would hope that you wouldn't hear in describing sort of material findings in the enforcement program that has to do with um, the altering of documents. Um, it goes without saying, and I'm sure that this is also shared, that uh, uh, in light of the, the important position that the audit profession has in terms of investor protection um, and the levels of professionalism required as well as um, the high levels in, of integrity and trust that we all agree should be the case, you know, I, I, find it, um, I find it very troubling that um, you're seeing this. So um, I guess the one thing, I understand that cases have facts and circumstances and perhaps the last thing I want to do is um, sort of tread into areas that are not appropriately discussed in public, but could you give us a sense as to the types of consequences that uh, people that are found to have engaged in such behavior are facing by reason of having done it? I've always thought the most serious was the, um, the yanking uh, of, the, uh, of the terrific privilege of auditing um, to, to be uh, prohibited, to be barred. Uh, to be barred from associating with, a, from participating in audits or associating with a firm is a very serious matter and it has collateral ripple consequences for state licensure. We, we keep NASBA and state authorities informed. Our, our bars have typically, and, our, and by the way, our fining, I think our fines have not typically been a major part of our program. Uh, the bars and the suspension from practice are what we rely on. Whether it's an individual or a firm, we regard that as very serious. Typically, we include a right to reapply after a certain period, and that sometimes can be conditioned on training and um, uh, CPE. Uh, various board members have various levels of comfort or discomfort with that. Uh, we have admitted, um, in rare circumstances, uh, we admitted some firms back into practice. I think it is not something that anyone should count on in lightly entering into a, uh, an order suspending from practice with a right to reapply, it would be a mistake to think that necessarily uh, it would be granted uh, for admission for association or practice. Some of the firms um, that are suspended are either um, on the way out of practice, um, on the way into liquidation, or already um, seeking to withdraw from registration. So there's that aspect of it too. But, but uh, Chuck, I regard the loss of the privilege of practice as being the biggest thing we do. 
we give scholarships based on the fines we collect. So we we create we have a scholarship program for accounting programs in universities that is it's a great pleasure for us to distribute that money every year. But uh, that's not the main thrust of the program. I think Philip Johnson wanted to comment on this particular point. Thanks, Marty. Um, I think that this is uh, a real issue for the profession because um, this really cuts to the core of the integrity of, uh, of the auditing profession if, uh, if documents are being uh, uh, altered or, or destroyed. Um, and could you just give me some feel as to how prevalent this is? Because I know if... Uh, um, because if, if this is starting to get an issue, and I've just been through the slides, and there are, there is a, there are slides on, on, uh, on this very subject, then we, I think that we really do have a, a major issue that uh, we need to, uh, uh, to address. So could you just give me a feel for, uh, and the other SAG members, a feel for how prevalent uh, this issue is? Because it really is a serious integrity issue if, uh, if it is pre uh, prevalent. Jim, were you going to respond to that? I, I agree with that. <laughs> uh, but fortunately, they are rare. Um, but we have emphasized it in an audit, audit practice alert. And uh, yes, we, we appreciate Phil's comments. I, I, do, I don't see this as a spreading. I, we don't have a trend on this. It's been rare, but it hasn't been isolated. And so it's something we're coming down hard on. I think just to add to those comments, we, we wouldn't have put out a staff, we put out, as you noted, the slides on it, and we put out a staff audit practice alert about the problem. We wouldn't have put it out if we didn't, if, we, if, it, was, if it happened once, if it just happened once. And so uh, inspections team and or enforcement have found enough instances of this to say that we need to put out the message about this, that this can't get done, and to reiterate what the rules are with respect to audit documentation. And I'll touch on that a little bit more in my... Um, standard setting update, but it was, it was sufficiently uh, enough instances to say we needed to put out some, a message through the staff practice alert about that the cover-up is worse than the crime. <laughs> the cover-up is the crime. Liz Morrell. Um, thank you very much, Marty. Um, I just welcome very much what Ken said about the transparency of the inspection findings. I think it's... Could you put the microphone a little closer to you, Liz? Okay, Thanks. thank you. Okay. Um, about the transparency of the inspection findings. Um, I would just like to highlight a practice that is now being followed in the UK in that the policy and reputation group, which actually constitutes the main six accounting firms, have come up with a set of KPIs that each of the firms publish in their annual transparency reports. And two of those KPIs are the results of the published inspection findings by our AQRT and also the results of their own quality control procedures. And I think that's been very much welcomed by the institutional investor community um, because it does give us some trans transparency. Um, also, we have uh, an audit firm governance code in the UK which requires the appointment of independent directors. I realize we're operating under a completely different regime probably. Um, but under that code, the independent or the independent non-executives, not directors, sorry, um, have a dialogue, an annual dialogue with investors. And during that dialogue, we very often ask them about the inspection findings. And what we do hear back is that they do follow up with the partnership. Um, so, from that point of view, I would say they appear to be setting the right tone at the top. That's good, useful information. Thanks for that. And uh, no, I know a lot of advances are taking place in your, in your market. Uh, Sri Ramawardi. I'd like to strike um, one item from my wish list. I, I wish uh, the profession uh, would uh, uh, stop using the term concurring partner and replace it with second partner because it is the job of a concurring partner to concur. What else will he do? And uh, Mark Twain said it very pointedly when he said, if you have two men holding the same opinion, we perhaps don't need one of them. So uh, I, I do believe we should try to move to the second partner 
uh, you know, moniker so that you know, people know that there is a possibility at least that the second partner might disagree. Well, we agree with you, and uh, that was the term of art uh, when, uh, before our standard went out, AS7, which we called the Engagement Quality Reviewer. So we uh, hopefully got rid of that term. Uh, there's no use of the term concurring partner in, in AS7, and Engagement Quality Review Partner uh, is, and, and, and the entire standard focuses around the independence and objectivity of that person to try to uh, get to a point exactly. Thanks. Uh, Bob Hurst. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I absolutely agree that the uh, inspection program is a you know, vital part of uh, maintaining and lifting water quality. And I, I think going to some random uh, approach in addition to the risk-based approach, I think makes a lot of, a lot of sense at this stage. Um, I kind of wonder if you thought about something like this, an analogy to what the bank regulators are doing on the major banks now, in addition to kind of the inspections of each bank they do what they're called horizontal reviews on kind of key topics across the banks. And, you know, it's not the specific inspection team. It's kind of experts in the particular topic. And, I, 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 you know, I think when that was first done on the major banks a few years ago when they started doing that, you know, there was not total enthusiasm in the, uh, in the <laughs> regulated institutions. But I, I, as a director of one of them, have found them very instructive because you find that you're very good at some things and not so good at other things, and it does lift, lift quality overall. We are very interested in this, Robert, because um, it, is, it is an aspect of what true randomization is. That it, it, it doesn't mean that if the team is in the Houston office <clears throat> and they said, we'd like to look at these four files, they suddenly say, look, but let's look at the fifth as well. I and mean, that's, that's sort of the, the old-fashioned way that lawyers did it with due diligence, and, and that really isn't the world we're living in. So, it, yes, um, a, a kind of a task force or a highly mobile team of inspectors that that would formulate some areas they want to look at across firms and across industries and would simply appear and go do those things. And it goes hand in hand with randomization. When the economists start talking about what you could do and what randomization would mean, this is part of it. And so I would hope we would have the resources and the ability to do this in the future. We're certainly trying to develop the uh, the formula and the, the plan, the way to do it. Tom Selling. Uh, on the earlier question of uh, document destruction, um, it occurs to me I see a link there between a topic we're going to be discussing later, that's the supervision of audits involving other auditors. I just wanted to observe that it seems to me that if uh, working papers are not available by or through a lead auditor and are, are, are very difficult, if not impossible, to obtain uh, through uh, the audit firm that they're supervising, then there's really no practical difference between that and effective document destruction. So I just wanted to kind of make that observation uh, when we consider that aspect of the supervision standards that are being proposed. It has implications for jurisdictions where we cannot inspect, obviously. When, when, the governments, when governments prohibit the export or the delivery of an audit file um, to, to our offices, that, that becomes a problem for that reason, Tom. I understand. I just wanted to kind of provide the context. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a whole session on that uh, uh, subject uh, tomorrow, and I'll touch on it in my update, but certainly uh, the lead auditor has to have the ability to have access to access to all of the work that's done by any auditor around the world. Uh, the ability to inspect might be one thing, but the, ability, the inability for the lead auditor to be able to understand the work that somebody else did would really preclude that lead auditor from signing an opinion. So um, the lead auditor has to have to ensure that they can gain an understanding of the work done uh, by those other auditors. Um, Maureen McNichols. I just want to um, echo the um, interest. Oh, thank you. I just want to echo the interest in the randomization. I think, um, uh, obviously, uh, the incentive properties are something that would be important to factor in in terms of consequences. It would also, um, I think, very much strengthen uh, the potential for research to make inferences about audit quality based on inspection data over time, looking ahead. Um, 
So I, I think that would be a, you know, a terrific direction, and I know you've heard from other academics on the properties and the benefits of that. Um, I also just want to um, acknowledge uh, uh, how impressed I am with the PCAOB's general commitment to reaching out to academics uh, and, and uh, drawing on the relevant research in the, uh, um, in, the, in the policy process and the inspection process and, and so forth. Um, I was very struck as I was reading the, um, the costs and benefits sections of the, um, the other auditor proposal, the, account, um, the audit uh, reporting model uh, document, um, how um, thoughtful, the disc how, how broad the research uh, uh, um, that was examined uh, was incorporated, how well that was incorporated, how thoughtful and how well it was weighed with the um, inspection information, what you know from your own inspections and also from the experience of uh, um, regulators in other countries uh, in the UK and Europe. Um, I think it just reflects the, um, the return on the investment that the PCIOB has made in, in, uh, in uh, understanding and uh, um, being able to carry out economic research. Thank you, Molly. Well, we appreciate all the research yeah. that you, you and your uh, fellow academics do to enable us to uh, leverage it all. So, so thanks go both ways. I think you're off the hook for any further questions. I don't see any uh, 10 cards up. So with that, I'll move to the next item on today's agenda. That's an update on standard setting activities. And um, there, are, there are some slides that were handed out that uh, you have that uh, you can follow along if you can see the print on them. Um, otherwise, they're, they're also in, fr in front of you on the screen. And once again, uh, if I didn't say this earlier, please feel free to raise your tent card at any time during my update on standard setting and don't wait till I'm finished. We're covering a lot of different topics. And so if you want to raise a question or make a comment about any particular project, do it at that point in time and we'll be glad to uh, entertain your your questions. So, as was mentioned uh, by Jim, we've had a lot of activities, including uh, standards with respect to transparency, supervision of other auditors and the auditor's reporting model, the issuance of a staff practice alert on improper alteration of audit documentation, and there's a number of other standard setting projects that are active that I'll, that I'll talk about. Um, First one I want, to, I want to cover is uh, the transparency uh, standard, which was adopted uh, by the board in December and, and recently approved by the SEC. Um, this initially was a, a recommendation of the Treasury's advisory committee to the auditing profession that the audit report should not only include the name of the firm, but the signature of the engagement partner. And it was felt by the advisory committee and the auditing profession that that would enhance the accountability of the engagement partner by signing the audit report. Um, it was also felt that the, that would be information that would be useful uh, for investors as well. Um, over the years, uh, we've had a number of proposals on this and reproposals and other documents and discussions at this standing advisory group and elsewhere. And for a variety of reasons, we ultimately moved from the actual signing of the report for some liability issues uh, that continually uh, continue to uh, cause us challenges in issuing this rule to the uh, disclosures uh, on a form instead. So as I mentioned, uh, December 15th, the board adopted the new rules and amendments that provide investors with other and other financial statement users with, with information about the engagement partner and other accounting firms that participates in the audits of issuers. And as I said, recently, May 9th, the SEC approved those rules and amendments. So the final rules require accounting firms to file a new PCOB form, form AP, uh, audit participants, for the reporting of certain audit participants for each issuer uh, client. And in that form, for each issuer audit, uh, that has to be disclosed who the, the name of the engagement partner on that audit, uh, the name, location, and extent of participation of each other accounting firm participating in the audit whose work constituted at least 5% of the total audit, 
and with respect to all of the other firms, just the number and aggregate extent of participation of the other accounting firms that participated, uh, whose individual participation was less than 5%. So, so what does this do? Of course, it gives uh, the, an accessible database the ability for anybody to determine for any particular audit they want to know about who was the engagement partner on that audit. Um, and also, for somebody, if uh, information comes out about a particular engagement partner who's having difficulties on a particular audit, gives uh, someone the ability to say, gee, I wonder what other clients uh, that person is, is serving. So we'll, the, that in, interested investor will have the ability to uh, look through this database and find out what other clients that engagement partner is serving or has served on. That will be a history of all activity from beginning with the starting of this, uh, this new reporting on Form AP. So this is information that investors, as they said, they would value. Uh, academic research has shown that it is valuable and they use this information in their decision making over time where engagement partners are disclosed in other markets. With respect to the, uh, the name, location, and extent of participation of other firms, uh, certainly in many multinational audits, there are a number of firms that participate. And as you know, each of the, even with respect to the global networks, each of the firms are individually legal separate entities around the world, and they have separate inspection reports. So whereas the lead uh, firm may have a, an inspection report that looks very good, knowing who the other firms are who participated enables uh, an interested party to, if they want to, look at the inspection reports of those other firms who participated to see what challenges or problems they may have. And also finding out the total participation of other firms gives a perspective of, well, did the lead auditor only do 10% of the audit work by hours and other firms did 90% of the work? And we've seen situations like that uh, with respect to especially uh, some work done by lead firms in the U.S where virtually uh, via reverse merges, most of the work was really done in, uh, in some other jurisdiction uh, and sometimes by firms that we can't even expect, inspect. So this gives uh, transparency into actually who is doing the audit uh, for the benefit of, of investors. I see one card up. Uh, Maureen, is your card still up from before? Yes, it is. Uh, Elizabeth Mooney? Thanks. Uh, this is great. The transparency is great. Just to, for clarification, has PCOB already decided wh whether this will be posted on the website in um, a searchable format? Is, are you going to help investors understand how to, wh where this information will be since it's not in the audit report? Yeah, Jessica will talk a little bit about that because this is really important stuff. So Form AP will be filed on our website and um, it will also um, be within a searchable database. We're going to have a Form AP landing page that's just for our website that um, investors can go to that will explain how to do the search. You, it'll have a link to where the search is. Obviously, that won't be available until these things start getting filed in 2017 um, for the search, but we are um, working on that now. It also will be downloadable for um, academics if they want to download the information. So we're trying to think of different ways that this could, would be used by investors and others and um, make it as user-friendly as possible. Thank you. Thanks. Sri Ramamurti. Marty, I also think this is a, a great uh, standard in terms of uh, enforcement activities where you do find a particular partner being a problem, you can now quickly go to the other engagements that that partner may have been involved in. And so this really enables the, the, the PCOB to act quickly rather than waiting to find out where else the problem could have uh, potentially uh, been an issue. So. Right. And we also hope that this disclosure further encourages, as the initial uh, Treasury recommendation was about, encourages high quality work by auditors because of the disclosure of the name of the engagement partner. So it's not just about searching for problems, but it's about encouraging high quality work and, and hopefully that comes out of this. Uh, Karen Nelson. Yes, following up on the, the form AP and the, the filing of that in a searchable database, I think that's a great 
idea, but, but one question I have looking ahead on, I guess, on your next slide is the timing of that. So it indicates here that the filing will be done with the PCOB within 35 days unless it's an IPO and then be placed in a searchable database. So my question is what impact this might have on investors who already have the, um, the filing, the financial information, but do not yet know the auditor information until 35 days or, or longer. So how long is it going to take for that information to come out and what impact that might have on investors' interpretation of the financial information in the interim period where they're waiting to get this other filing? So I'll start on that and then uh, Jessica, maybe you can add if you have further thoughts. So uh, um, on, on the next page is, um, well, let me just finish one thought on this slide and I'll get to your question. Um, in addition to filing on Form AP, auditors can voluntarily provide the same disclosures in the audit report. Um, if that's done and maybe preparers might uh, want that information out there so that it could be at the same time as the audit report is filed. But that's certainly, that's a voluntary uh, provision. Uh, and and may, again, maybe some auditors might want to distinguish themselves by doing that. We, we spent a lot of time with respect to the question of time and certainly Signing the engagement report would give the information to investors immediately. Um, however, um, if it was only signing and not on a form, it wouldn't be searchable at the same time. So the form actually provides other benefits than just having the information right in the, the audit report at the same day. Um, well, when you think about it, most, uh, let's, for, let's take the large firms, they have a lot of audits that are completed on February 28th of 2017 and um, trying to gather all of that information with respect to all of their audits that are included with respect to um, uh, that firm and get that information filed accurately. Uh, we, had, we had a couple of trade-offs to make and, and we thought about the, both the engagement partner information but also the information about other accounting firms and, and that information would take a bit more time to accumulate with respect to the many different engagements that uh, an audit firm has and with respect to the filing. So we, we put out, a, and when we put this out for comment, we asked some questions about timing and, uh, and we had some trade-offs to make. And it was felt that at the end of the day, that this timing of, it was probably faster than the firms actually wanted, but they uh, understood that the importance of this and not quite as fast as some investors would like. But again, having the information 35 days after the audit report is first included in the document filed with the SEC was felt that that would be a, a reasonable time frame to get this uh, information out uh, in the trade-off of costs and benefits. Um, and of course, uh, once the information is filed the first time, the research will enable someone to know probably who was the partner on that year's filing unless there was a change in the, in the auditor as well because uh, typically the, the engagement partner is on the job for, you know, five years. So, but that was a good question. Uh, we spent some time on that and, and, and the trade-offs involved in that issue. Um, and as you said, 10 days uh, with respect to an IPO. Um, Brian, did you have a comment to Marianne Croto with respect to this? I, I did. Thanks, Marty. Yep. And as always, these are my own, not necessarily those commission, commissioners or other staff. Um, just on the, on the PCOB use point, I thought maybe important just to add that this was more about transparency of this information publicly. Of course, the PCOB has the ability and gains this information today as part of inspection planning. So to the extent that they're finding an inspection is a problem with one audit engagement partner today, they're able to today look at, at other engagements that partner has worked on. And then I, I guess I was just going to mention on the, um, on the timing. Um, you know, and maybe, maybe Maureen or others would have something to say about this, but the 35 days and the 10 days is something that, that probably will now allow for um, a, a good amount of research relative to how that information is being used and the timing of that information. And certainly I would think the PCOB could over time think about that, that, that timing as well and make sure that that's actually serving investors' needs and see what the reactions are and those kinds of things. So I thought I would just add, add perspectives on, on, on that. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Philip Johnson. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, obviously, this is this is a, a, a good move, uh, but it is uh, it's providing information for the uh, for the investor uh, public. Um, in Europe, we found that uh, 
by signing the name of the individual, it enhanced the accountability and responsibility taken by the, uh, by the partner themselves. If you, it's like any form. If you put your name on the bottom, then you always read it before you, uh, before you sign it. Uh, and I'm, that's just an, uh, an example of, of how people uh, behave. Um, I understand the litigation issues. I understand the, uh, the journey that you've been through to get to this stage. And, and to get here is a, big, uh, is, is a big achievement. And you do say that firms can voluntarily disclose the name of the audit partner in the audit report. But is, as far as the PCOB is concerned, is this the end of the journey? Or is there another stage where you will continue to try and get auditors, audit partners to sign in their own name, um, given the landscape and given the enhancement of that accountability and responsibility? Philip, there, there is a view held by some eccentrics in the room that the market may take over. I am heartened by the number of audit committees who disclose, as one of our SAG members uh, who chairs an audit committee points out, take pleasure in, in disclosing voluntarily the tenure of their audit firm and explaining why the tenure, in their view, relates to good consequences for the company's audit. And uh, I, I have thought that one of the strengths of this release was that it still reserves to the firms uh, the ability to include the name of the engagement partner in the audit report uh, if they so choose. The, the requirement is to, point, to file Form AP, but I, I do think here's, this is an area in which we may test uh, several hypotheticals. One is um, the one that you have, the, the, the phenomenon, the behavioral result you've uh, mentioned in, in Europe and in the UK. Another may be whether there is serious litigation risk of any kind associated with this here. I thought, I've always thought, as I've said before, that as a lawyer there was, a, after uh, Jana's, while it's not entirely clear, uh, there is real doubt as to whether there is any significant litigation risk here. So we may find out several things as a result of market forces once this is in effect. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Bob Hurth. Great. Thanks, Marty. I have a um, comment and a question, and I actually did sign my name to opinions in another country, and I don't, I don't know, Philip, if it made me do things any differently or not, but uh, that's beside the point. So the, um, the comment I had was all this sounds really great, um, and time will tell, but I want to be sure people are aware of or think about the unintended consequences of using a searchable database to all of a sudden find what other audits Bob Hurth is the partner on, and my guilty until proven innocent on all the other engagements, and does the media go crazy with me and turn me into someone that I may not be? So that, I think that's, you know, time will tell how we use all that information. The other thing that happens too is that when you know the partner's name, the press is at the bottom of the building waiting for you to interview you. So I just want to be sure you're aware of that stuff that happens. We don't just kind of all of a sudden use the searchable database and have someone, like I said, be guilty on every other assignment and really understand what the issues are surrounding the issues on the audit. And then the question that I had was, when the information is provided by engagement partner or by engagement, how long does that information stay on the database? So for example, if I were the partner of ABC company and this starts and I'm in year three or four of my partner responsibility, and then I rotate off, how long do people know that I was the partner on that engagement? The information on the database is, uh, will be forever. <laughs> so in other words, once, it, once we start including the information on the database about any particular audit, uh, who was the engagement partner that year, and who were the other participants, of uh, what other firms, and the extent of their participation, that is on the database and searchable for as long as we continue to do this until we modify things, as Philip said, if that ever happens in the future. But uh, right now, uh, there's no expectation that uh, this information wouldn't uh, always be, be available. Um, and, and, and with respect to your other comment, as I said earlier, this is not just about finding out for the engagement partner, you know, what other bad work did he or she do? Hopefully it's about what are the 
good work is that engagement partner on, and um, hopefully it uh, incentivizes uh, engagement partners to even do higher quality work than they do today. Sri, is your card still up from before, or did you have another question? Okay, the last thing with respect to uh, this uh, matter is, I'm sorry, you're hitting over had, my right, Sandy. Yeah, I guess I had Sandy one comment and, and, and probably a pretty strong reaction to what was just said in the sense that, you know, anybody who has um, been um, a chief principal financial officer or signed um, a public company document is subject to the same degree of scrutiny um, that, uh, that, that is the concern that's expressed there. And I think that that's exactly what investors want. They want accountability and to know who's actually signing. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by that consistent or that persistent notion that, you know, that this is going to be bad for those individuals because it's already, that sort of criteria is already there for um, boards of directors and, and principal financial officers and CEOs and the like. So that comment's a little um, troubling to me. You know, we've advocated f um, for this disclosure because we see that in other countries that it is actually effective. Um, I'm troubled a little bit by um, the delay, but it's going to be what it's going to be, right? But I also um, think that it's important that we don't initially put this database out there and say, um, well, look, investors aren't using it, because I think there also needs to be some publicity um, so that investors know that this is actually happening. I mean, we've tweeted about it and talked about it and all those sorts of things, but it's going to also take some time. And certainly there's going to be when there's a defalcation or some problem that there's going to be searches of that and, and press about it, just as there are in every um, company um, when something like that happens. But I, I do think that there's a need to um, better educate investors that this has happened and to get that out in the, in the public domain even more so. While they've known, but it's going to take time for that to become even more of common knowledge for investors. Yeah, as Jessica said, this will be prominent on our, on our website uh, that this database is there. And to your point, we, we did make, uh, others had made that argument about making the person's name known that therefore they're, they're now known. And of course, uh, CEOs and CFOs have long certified uh, the 10K and uh, not to the best of our knowledge, and we argued this in the, in the release adopting this, that that was not an issue. So, uh, Ken Golden? Uh, I'm going to follow up with Sandra. The, um, so several of us, I think, in this room were part of the Treasury Subcommittee on a lot of the issues in the audit profession, and this is back about 10 years ago, and we tried to get it done then. Um, I'm, glad, I'm frankly glad it's done now. Um, I actually was hoping it would be part of the opinion itself as opposed to in a separate document. But I, I was going to change, actually change the word. I, I, I feel a little differently. I, I feel someone should be proud to put their name down on it. So, so yes, there's more uh, potentially responsibility, whatever term you want. But I, to me, uh, when I, I know when I sign documents, I feel proud to sign them. Uh, and I feel proud for my work. It's the way I think. And I think the same should be relative to the partners. So instead of thinking about liability, which I've heard over and over again over the years about this matter, I think, the, frankly, the partners should feel good about putting their name behind their work. It's just as simple as that, actually. I agree with you 100 percent and would have preferred to see a, an engagement partner signature. But uh, someone said before, this is a long journey. And uh, this is where we have wound up. And the information will now be made available to investors, uh, Jessica. Um, starting with the engagement partner for auditors reports issued <coughs> on or after January 31, 2017. So effectively year end 2016 uh, audits, uh, the information will be on our website with respect to the engagement partner. Uh, firms indicated in their comment letters, uh, again, greater challenges in collecting the data for each of those, there are many audits about who the other firms were participating and ensuring that that information was accurate before it was filed and ask for a little bit more time for, to get their systems in place. So with respect to other firms, that will not start to be disclosed until what are reports issued on or after June 30, 2017. Uh, for the firms, uh, again, they've, we're working on some staff guidance to uh, make it clear how the, the operationability of our, of our systems work such that uh, this, goes, this goes smoothly. 
Let me turn to uh, the next topic, the supervision of other auditors. Uh, this is a very uh, important proposal to, to issue. Uh, we had a couple of standards which actually already addressed the use of other auditors. And the standards, uh, are, in my view, clearly needed improvement in terms of really directing the lead auditor to take uh, responsibility and oversight for the work of those other auditors. Uh, the existing standard wasn't really uh, risk-based in terms of the lead auditor's uh, oversight of the work of other auditors. Um, separately, uh, our inspections had noticed uh, significant deficiencies in the work of other auditors uh, in performing their work that the, re that the lead auditor didn't find as part of their overview of that work. And so improving the standard such that the lead auditor has greater involvement in and responsibility for the work and oversight of the work of the other auditors should improve the audit quality done by those many other firms around the world who may have different incentives uh, in, in performing their work than the, than the lead auditor has, who has final responsibility for the audit. Um, so on April 12th, uh, the board uh, issued this proposal to strengthen the requirements uh, for lead auditors and provide a more uniform approach to supervision and audits that involve other auditors. Uh, it amends existing requirements uh, pertaining to supervision, planning, documentation, as well as the, not concurring partners three, but the engagement quality review with respect to uh, other auditors. Um, there are also uh, relatively few instances where the lead auditor um, doesn't have the ability to get into review or, or see the work of those other auditors. If that's the case, we don't think that the lead auditor should nonetheless take responsibility for the entire audit if they can't have access to the work done by the other auditor. That happens most frequently in the situations we see where there might be an equity investment that's significant and management doesn't have the ability to get their own auditor of the, of the top company to get their lead auditor into that equity investee and they have a different auditor in that company. So this proposal uh, includes a, a new standard for circumstances in which the lead auditor divides responsibility with another firm. That was permitted under existing standards. This new standard uh, increases uh, somewhat the responsibilities of the lead auditor in determining the qualifications of that other auditor when they divide responsibility. That other auditor's report, uh, has, that other auditor has to be mentioned in the audit report, including the scope of work and the amount of work that, that they performed. The comment period on this ends on July 29th, 2016. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, some of the key changes, this applies a single approach for supervision. There was a couple of standards that could be applied in this world of supervising other auditors. So this is a single approach for the supervision of the work of all other auditors when the lead auditor assumes responsibility for that work. As I mentioned, this is linked in and tied into our uh, risk assessment standards. It includes more specific response requirements for the lead auditor's supervision of other auditors to prompt the other auditor to be more involved in the work of those other auditors, especially in the areas of, of greatest risk of material misstatement. So really our incentive here is that the lead auditor be very actively involved in, is required to be actively involved in determining the scope of work that the other auditors do, setting the tolerable misstatement for the other auditors, determining what type of opinion that they want from the other auditor or what type of report or work papers they want sent back and determine that all of that was, was done and conclude that the other auditor performed the work in accordance with those instructions. instructions. Um, it also includes a requirement that whenever other auditors work on the audit, determine that the firm issuing the audit report sufficiently participates in the audit to serve as the lead auditor. Again, we have seen some instances where, and I mentioned a case before where maybe the lead auditor did only a handful of the work and 90% of the work was done in some other market by some other auditor. Um, hopefully this new standard would not, would not permit that to happen as the lead auditor has to uh, audit a significant portion of the risks of material misstatement with respect to that any particular, uh, any particular audit. 
and guidance and rules are given with respect to the determination as to whether or not your, sufficiency, uh, your participation is sufficient for you to serve as the lead auditor. The standard, proposed standard also strengthens existing standards by providing more specific requirements regarding the lead auditor's responsibility to gain an understanding of the qualifications of the other auditors at the outset of the audit, including an understanding as to whether or not they'll be able to gain access to the work papers of those other auditors. But it's really geared to make sure that the lead auditor knows who is the engagement partner on the many different subsidiaries around the world and the other lead people who are responsible for supervision. And are those the right people? Do they have the right capabilities for this particular industry and for this particular audit to support that work and to do high quality auditing to support the role of the, of the lead auditor? So you have to gain that understanding about the qualifications at the outset of the audit in order to, to set the proper scope of work to be performed and to set the proper uh, to, uh, capability for you to have the right work to review. As I said, this proposal will be reviewed, uh, discussed even in more detail tomorrow. If there are no questions, I'll turn to the uh, auditor's reporting model. This is a, like the transparency standard, which got a lot of attention from investors and is very important to investors. This has been one where there's been a consistent outcry for investors for more information in the audit report and more useful information audit report. The audit report in the United States has not effectively changed in some 75 years or so. And basically the audit report says the auditor did an audit and the audit financial statements either present fairly the financial position of the company or it doesn't. And that's about all the audit report says. And investors have said that's not very useful information. The opinion itself, very important to know that there's an unqualified opinion on the report or whether there's a qualification or a going concern, uncertainty in the report. But other than that, uh, audits can cost uh, millions of dollars or in some cases $100 million and all the investor knows is that an audit was done with little information. The purpose of this was to provide valuable information to investors that they could use as part of their assessment of the financial statements. So on May 11th, just recently, the board reproposed for public comment this new auditor reporting standard that makes the audit report more relevant and informative to investors and other financial statement users. Uh, the comment period on this ends on August 15th, uh, 2016. I'll make some more comments about this, but I saw Elizabeth Mooney's card go up. Do you want to pose a question I or a comment? I can do it at the end. It was actually on the last topic, sorry. So I can do it at the end if you do Go ahead. Um, on the other auditors, I think when I'm thinking about China and some other Asia and jurisdictions and curious, you know, is, is there deference? I, I'm trying to figure out how the supervision works for like the multinationals. Will there be deference to the local laws in some areas? Would, would the um, auditors need to get visas to get, I mean, how, how they'll be able to step up supervision where um, there are restrictions like that? The lead auditor has to fulfill the, the planning and supervisory responsibilities of the audit with respect to all other auditors wherever they're located. And there's no distinction drawn. If the lead auditor is unable to get satisfactory access to the work done, um, unable to review work papers that the lead auditor thinks he or she needs to review, that would be a scope limitation. Uh, Thank you. So uh, there, there's no deference given to the fact that uh, you can do less work and serve as a lead auditor if some of the work's done in some other market. Philip, did you have a follow-up on that? That's where I have a, an issue with having uh, the proposed new standard allowing other auditors to be named in the audit opinion. And I've been basically having two opinions. Because from my perspective, the lead auditor is providing assurance uh, over the financial statements as a whole. And if there is an equity investor and you can't get, in, you can't get access to the, the work papers of the auditor uh, as you described, then I, I think that's a scope limitation and should be said, uh, rather than having a standard. From my perspective, uh, I think that uh, it should be one, uh, one opinion uh, and it's just picking up on, on what was said there. And I was going to raise that point but was, and then, gonna, then 
raise it again uh, next time, but I think because of this, this, this uh, exchange, I think it is important that we, you know, we don't treat uh, uh, matters in a different way. Just because you can't get access into China is no different than the, having access to another U.S. firm, for example, you know, on, on a particular aspect of that, uh, of that balance sheet. Well, this is getting back to the divided responsibility scenario, and sorry, we're back off the auditor's reporting model, but, the, but uh, these questions, that's all right, we'll, we'll take them, they're important. Um, so we'll, we're interested in comments on, on the proposal, but uh, I guess there's two alternatives, and one is, let's just say, and I don't think this is an issue with respect to, to China, really. It's, this is a, typically auditors are able to get access to that audit work and to review the work there. This is typically more of a situation where there's an, an, a separate ownership issue, let's say an equity investee or something, where the, the, the corporation has a, a, an equity investee. It's material to the financial statements, but they have their own auditor, and the lead auditor just can't get into that company to review that work. And um, so rather than having a scope limitation, this provides the possibility <coughs> for that other auditor to do an audit in accordance with PCOB standards of that separate entity and for it to be disclosed in the audit report that with respect to a certain amount of the assets or a certain amount of the revenue or income <coughs> that the audit report uh, relies entirely on that other audit of that portion of the audit and that auditor is named in that report that financial statements and that audit report are filed with Securities and Exchange Commission and are available for investors to see. So again, uh, interested to see, have comments on that if some thinks that's not the right. I, I do know that the IAASB standards, the analogous standard for group audits, does not permit divided responsibility, whereas the U.S. does. Liz, do you have a question uh, on the same issue? You, you've actually just answered my question because it was about the fact that other international standards don't have this divided responsibility and just how they address it. I think, cause I think from an institutional investor perspective, you know, we, we firmly believe that the group auditor should take responsibility for the audit as a whole, as Philip has articulated. We do too, and we hope that would be the case. And, and it, I said this is relatively few cases, but if the lead auditor cannot, for whatever reasons, um, then the question arises, is it better to have a scope limitation and, and, and not, have a, not have an unqualified opinion, or is it better to have the ability to have another auditor do an audit in accordance with PCOB standards, um, which means we'd have the ability, uh, uh, which, which gives transparency to that work to the investor. But again, we have that out for comment, and uh, we'll be interested in, in views on that. All right. Let me uh, continue on the auditor's reporting model if there's no further questions on the last uh, standard. Um, so the, getting back to the auditor's reporting model, it would retain the pass-fail model uh, in the existing auditor's report, uh, which investors felt was important, but it would also require communication of critical audit matters. And I'll get to that in a minute, but this is really the most important aspect of the, the proposal I'll get to the definition shortly, but the critical audit matters are really, we often talk about it as those matters that kept the auditor awake at night, the tough subjective decisions that they had to make with respect to the audit, and it requires disclosure of those critical audit matters that meet certain criteria that I'll talk about in a second and how the auditor responded to those matters in the audit. It also clarifies uh, certain existing auditor responsibilities, especially around the auditor's responsibility in the audit for fraud. So uh, there'll be a new statement required in the, in the audit that the uh, auditor pl planned and performed the audit to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether due to error or fraud would be added to the uh, <coughs> audit report. Those words were not in the report before, while those responsibilities existed in the auditing standards. Uh, requires new elements related to auditor tenure. This was proposed in the original proposal in 2013 on auditor tenure and a statement about the auditor's responsibility to comply with independence requirements. Um, we are interested to see that uh, there's been quite an increase in disclosure of auditor tenure in, in proxy statements. This would put, uh, put auditor tenure in one place 
in all cases available for everybody to see, not just with, with respect to 35% of the companies that might be disclosing it in proxies, but with respect to 100%, therefore. <coughs> um, turning to the next slide. So the concept of critical audit matters was carried forward from the 2013 proposal, <coughs> but refined in a number of ways in respect to, in respect to comments that we had received. <coughs> it limits the source of potential critical audit matters to matters communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee. That's a narrower population than was, than was in the proposal, but we think it's the right population, those matters that were required to be or communicated to the audit committee. It also adds a materiality component to the definition that it should relate to matters that are material to the financial statements. That was another item that people were concerned about that immaterial issues could be discussed uh, through critical audit matters. It narrowed the definition to only those matters that involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex audit judgment. And it expanded the communication requirement from the 2013 proposal to require the auditor to describe how the critical audit matter was addressed in the audit. And we also revised the documentation requirement. Uh, there'll be uh, an additional session on the auditor's reporting model later today. But um, just, just to frame that, again, the auditor must determine whether there are critical audit matters in an audit of the current period's financial statements. And a critical audit matter is any matter arising from the audit of the financial statements that was communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee and that relates to accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements and involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex judgment. Um, in the release adopting this, we indicate that we believe that expanding the auditor's report to provide information about these especially challenging subjects or complex auditor judgments should help investors and other financial statement users better consume the information that's in the financial statements because it's, it's giving the investor the ability to, first of all, look at the audit report and have the investor understand what did the auditor find to be the most critical matters, the most challenging subjective matters in the audit, and then to look at the financial statements through that lens. And so it should help investors to better use or consume that financial information that's being reported through the, through the eyes of the auditor. We've uh, included in the proposal, and hope you'll look at this, a number of examples or a couple of examples of hypothetical situations uh, and hypothetical critical audit matter disclosures. And the only thing I want to point out about those examples, and I do hope uh, you look at them and all commenters look at them, is that the way they're written, they're intended to demonstrate that the disclosure of critical audit matters are clearly not intended to be boilerplate disclosures about this was a subjective area, X, and go see note Y to the financial statements and list one procedure that, or two that was done. They're clearly specific to the company being audited. The examples are intended to show that. They're very specific to that audit, and, uh, and they're clearly not boilerplate. So I want to emphasize that point when you, when you, when you look at this and comment on, on the disclosure of critical audit matters. Uh, Chuck Senator. Marty, <clears throat> quick question, and apologies to my colleagues if this is something that might be obvious to the rest of you, but when you mentioned um, the gating factor of having the materiality issue sort of be germane to the financial statement, to me that suggests a, a highly quantitative materiality standard. Does it include qualitative materiality, or are we talking solely quantitative? Materiality is always a concept that's both quantitative and qualitative, so certainly anything that's uh, material in any of those aspects, quantitatively or qualitatively. Good question. Okay. Uh, this subject has already gotten a fair amount of discussion, um, uh, the improper alteration of audit documentation, but uh, as indicated, a staff practice alert uh, was issued on April 21st with respect to this. And again, enough situations were noted via our inspections and oversight activities that heighten concerns about uh, the alteration of documents at many firms, including firms affiliated with uh, global networks as well as other firms. And we wanted to clearly point out that the consequences of improper alteration in many cases is more severe than the underlying perceived audit deficiency. And that message is uh, said loud and clear 
through the, through the practice alert. Um, I wanted to share with you here, um, it is possible that there are, there are reasons to change documentation after the audit is complete, but there are specific rules and our standards around that. And auditors have to adhere, and they must adhere to these rules and can't alter documents in any other way. So a complete and final set of documentation is required to be assembled for retention as of the date not more than 45 days after the report release date. That's called the document completion date. And then our standards say that audit documentation must not be deleted or discarded after the document completion date. However, information may be added. But any documentation that is added must indicate the date the information was added, the name of the person who prepared the additional documentation, and the reason for adding it. A firm may determine after the audit report was issued that they didn't do enough work in a certain area. Sometimes our inspections point that out. And audit firms go back and, and perform additional procedures after the report date. But clearly, any additional procedures performed after the report date have to indicate why additional work was done, who did it, the date it was done, and the reason for adding that work. Uh, alteration for any other reason to obscure uh, information from their inspection or to indicate that work was done that really wasn't done is a serious violation with serious consequences uh, as part of our rules. Any uh, comments? Uh, John LeComics. Oh, microphone. <laughs> my fault. Please. Um, my understanding is that some of the alterations have involved inserting documentation and failing to date it or intentionally backdating. And so maybe this is better addressed to Brian, but it would seem to me that that is an attempt to commit fraud. And would the SEC consider criminal uh, prosecution for that? No, Brian, if you want to respond to that, certainly the PCOB takes this very seriously and is Jim Doty mentioned before has imposed suspensions or bars on the ability for an auditor to practice. And so uh, I understood that the SEC has criminal authority and that was a specific question. Well, well and, and, and actually I think um, you'll, you'll see that the document does reference other implications from an SEC perspective including potential criminal um, uh, implications. And so you know, that is actually referenced in, in the document and, um, and, and you're absolutely right. Thanks, uh, Brian, and thanks, John. Elizabeth Mooney. I have one other question back on the transparency, if that's okay. Um, just um, what, what happens if a firm is late filing uh, or if it files a, fir a form that has errors? Well, just like if there's a deficiency in their audit, uh, we have our inspection processes and uh, reports on firms, so, so, you know, we'll look for corrective mechanisms uh, for that. So, uh, that we, you know, we'll be monitoring and uh, uh, if necessary, we'll, firms will have to improve their quality controls if they're not getting things in on time. And if they're ignoring the rule, just like any other PCAOB rule, there are consequences. Are the consequences clear or is it, it's, uh, is it uh, Have they been decided? Is that no, not at this stage. Let me turn to some other standard setting projects and let me move along a little bit uh, quickly here as I have a lot to cover between now and the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, other key projects include uh, the auditor's responsibility for a auditing or a company's ability to continue as a going concern, our projects on accounting estimates and fair value measures, the use of the work of specialists and quality control standards. So these are projects, key projects that are ongoing at this stage. Uh, turning to uh, the going concern project, in light of changes to the accounting requirements and clearly uh, as we've heard from at the investor advisory group a couple of times and then probably here, investor concerns about companies failing without the early warnings that were intended by Section 10A of the Exchange Act and the related auditing standard the staff is evaluating potential revisions to our existing auditing standard, AU 341 or AS 2415 as reorganized. 
Um, we're considering input from a variety of sources and we're right now performing a lot of outreach and research to determine in what ways we should uh, potentially revise our stand to 341, including taking into account the activities of, of accounting standard setters. The staff issued a practice alert in 2013 after the change uh, by FASB uh, last, uh, in 2013, which would require disclosures, um, I'm sorry, practice alert 13, after uh, FASB uh, announced disclosure requirements by management with respect to uh, uh, the risk of going concern uncertainties. FASB added a responsibility beginning at this year end for management to make evaluation on a quarterly basis and disclose when there is substantial doubt as defined in that standard about that company's ability to continue as a going concern. And as they defined it, substantial doubt was when it was probable that a company would be unable to pay their debts as they fell due in the, in the 12 months from the report date. Um, the PCOB auditing standard with respect to this and, and Section 10A does not define substantial doubt and it's a qualitative term that many have said uh, falls within the range potentially of more likely than not up to, to probable. And so we've been assessing our auditing standard in light of the, uh, the FASB action. But practice alert 13 that we issued uh, when FASB adopted their standard reminds auditors of a couple of things. First of all, their responsibility to assess the disclosures that are made in response to the accounting framework. So whether it's uh, an audit uh, be being performed where the underlying framework is IFRS and the term significant doubt is used, or material uncertainties that give rise to significant doubt in IFRS, or whether the term that's used uh, in FASB substantial doubt when it's probable that a company can't pay its debts as they fall due in the next uh, 12 months, um, the auditor has to audit management's evaluation of their ability to continue going concern in accordance with the requirements of that accounting framework. But then the auditor also has to look at the requirements in our auditing standard uh, 2415 to evaluate whether there's disclosures beyond what may be required by management a substantial doubt in accordance with the qualitative uh, analysis and assessment required in our auditing standard. And the final point on this slide is that a determination that no disclosure is required under the applicable financial reporting framework is not conclusive as to whether an explanatory paragraph is required under our auditing standards. So yes, evaluate the accounting requirements under the accounting standards which differ between IFRS and GAAP, but that evaluation um, and determine that, that, that disclosures are appropriate under that accounting framework, but if, if no disclosure is made and substantial doubt under the probability threshold, for instance, under FASB is, is not reached, that doesn't mean that's a conclusive determination for the auditor with respect to auditing under PCOB auditing standards, which has a more qualitative assessment of going concern. We are continuing to evaluate and assess what changes might be necessary to our standards in this area. Um, a very important project deals with the auditors, pardon me, uh, Tom Selling. Uh, it, it just occurs to me that, that these are two separate reporting regimes and the auditor purports to be independent when the auditor has to make a judgment. The auditor makes his judgment independently. So. Uh, might, might the language uh, in the staff alert could have actually been stronger and would have said that notwithstanding the management's judgment, the auditor makes an independent evaluation in accordance with auditing standards whether, uh, whether going concern qualification is required? That point uh, is certainly made in our auditing standards that the entire audit of the financial statements is made uh, with an independent uh, frame of mind. And so the audit of the financial statements, including all disclosures, including management disclosures around uh, going concern, the auditor has to do that with a, their own independent assessment of the fairness of those presentations. So I, point taken, I think that point is made in our, in our auditing standards. This project is a 
particularly important project because of the increased use of fair value measurements and growing complexity of accounting estimates in, in the frameworks. Um, also, this is an area where our inspection staff continues to find uh, significant deficiencies, and, and that's not surprising. I mean, the most complex areas of financial reporting go to the, the complex accounting estimates and fair value measurements, and uh, significant complex assumptions are often part of those determinations. But our, our standards do require that auditors understand those assumptions and evaluate the reasonableness of those assumptions. But nonetheless, this is an area where we've been, inspections has found and continues to report a high number of deficiencies. So as a result of that, um, we have been performing outreach and we've issued a staff consultation paper on this subject uh, and we've had discussions on that staff consultation paper with the SAG at, the at, a, at a number of meetings. And so uh, the staff is, is currently uh, working on a proposal uh, to improve the auditing standards in this area. At the same time, and, and Arnold uh, Schilder will talk about this uh, later, but the IAASB has a project where they're looking at their analogous standard, ISA 540, which deals with auditing accounting estimates and fair value measures. And uh, we are an official observer to their task force and uh, participating in their ISA 540 meetings. And so we're, we're dealing with many of the same issues. Um, the auditor's identification and response when there is significant measurement uncertainty in accounting estimate or a fair value measure, the importance of applying professional skepticism and evaluating contradictory evidence and looking at uh, an accounting estimate or a fair value measure, uh, the increasing use of pricing services and how the auditor needs to respond to the uh, use of the pricing service by, by management in, a, in their fair value measurement or how an auditor use it, but uses a pricing service as well as further aligning our standards with the risk assessment standards. Um, I think Arnold will indicate, indicate that their, their project is on target or geared to issue a proposal towards the end of uh, 2017, and we're working diligently to, uh, towards the end of 2016, and we're working hard to get to that same place. Uh, sort of a companion project for us is the auditor's use of the work of specialists. specialists are often employed by the auditor in areas where there are complex accounting estimates or complex fair value measurements, and the auditor believes that they need additional skill beyond accounting and auditing to audit those estimates or fair value measures. And so with the growing complexity and growing use of the es complex estimates and fair value measures in accounting frameworks, there's growing use of the work of specialists. And again, here our inspection staff has observed deficiencies in the use of specialists in a number of audits, including uh, the lack of a clear expectations with the specialists regarding the work to be performed, or the auditor not adequately evaluating the specialist's uh, basis for determining the reasonableness of the significant assumptions uh, so that the auditor could in turn determine that those significant assumptions are reasonable or, or, or not evaluating contradictory evidence identified by the specialist. So once again, this is an area where we've issued a staff consultation paper and addressed the many issues to be considered in the use of specialists. We've had discussions with the SAG on a number of occasions and we're developing a proposal for the board's uh, consideration. And again, we're coordinating because most commenters on both the consultation paper on estimates and on specialists said because of the linkage of the two, we think that any proposal that you put out should put a proposal out on estimates and specialists at the same time so that we can comment on these two items at the same time. And that's our goal. Uh, again, some of the key issues being considered are definition of a specialist, um, in particular the auditor's consideration of the work of a company specialist. Right now the auditing standards uh, essentially put the company specialists on the same level as the use of, uh, if the auditor uses an engaged specialist and there's no really distinction in the current auditing standards about the work of the auditor and their ability to use the work of a company specialist or a, or a specialist they might engage. So we're certainly looking at that and whether there should be a separate standard addressing the auditor specialist from the a, a standard that considers the work that might be done by a, a company specialist. And then, as I mentioned, the integration of the requirements with the uh, estimate standard. 
And the last thing I want to mention is a project uh, we have, and again, a project on the agenda of the IAASB to examine the uh, audit firm system of quality controls. Uh, these are areas where hold great promise to, to reduce audit deficiencies with further improvements in, in firm quality controls. And, and our inspections have been doing this, identifying problems that go to the firm's quality controls that if you get to the root cause of the issue, the firm's quality controls can help uh, prevent a deficiency before it occurs in an audit. And so improving quality controls within firms has the promise to reduce uh, audit deficiencies and audits. Um, we have a multi-divisional team that's performing research and outreach to explore what changes to the quality control standards could prompt firms to improve their quality control systems further and in turn, uh, and in turn audit quality. We're considering uh, all academic research in this regard, SAG input, and the activities that both the, the PCOB has been doing, inspections on root cause analysis, and the audit firms themselves are doing on root cause analysis of their deficiencies. And once again, we're participating uh, on a task force of the IAASB that's looking at their analogous quality control standards. This would be an area where we think it would be beneficial that if the IAASB standards and our standards had relatively common frameworks for firms' quality controls as opposed to very different frameworks, which might be challenging for firms to work with. Um, that, includes, that concludes my comments on uh, standards. Uh, Philip? One very quick question, Marty. In the November SAG meeting, uh, we had <coughs> excuse me, a long discussion, including breakout ses uh, uh, sessions on audit quality indicators. Uh, could you just update the SAG of where the PCOB has got with regard to that uh, quite sizable project? I'll take a stab at that, and then maybe uh, one of the board members or Jim might want to uh, participate. So we've received great input from... Uh, the comment letters we received on audit quality indicators as well as the extensive discussion we had at the SAG meeting. Many of the SAG members, uh, as Greg Jonas went around the table at the end of that meeting, as you might recall, indicated that um, their recommendation was for continued experimentation by audit committees and, and auditors with audit quality indicators and to see how that evolved. Um, on the other hand, there were some investors that said, we're interested in seeing a report on audit quality indicators and seeing what audit quality indicators are, audit committees are looking at, and we want to assess them for ourselves. So we're, we're still, as an organization, taking all of that into account as we determine what next steps uh, we officially take at the PCOB. Some suggested we put out a list of what we think good audit quality indicators are and uh, that audit committees could choose from those and working with audit committees and just give some guidance. There are others that wanted to see some rulemaking. So this is still in deliberation between staff and the board in terms of next steps. But I don't know, Jim, or any other board members, if you'd like to comment further. Jay? Uh, uh, Marty, I think you summarized it. Uh, well, and, and I'll just uh, express my personal view, views here that uh, since we haven't made any formal decisions a, a, as a board, that I, I think uh, continuing to make progress on, on uh, refining the indicators is, is really important. Um, finding the facts to uh, actually uh, make the, the causal connections is a bit of a challenge. We have a lot of data that we've collected over the years, but maybe not enough to do, uh, do that that exercise. Um, I, I personally uh, am a little bit hesitant to endorse coming up with a shortened list of these are the best uh, audit quality indicators because we don't necessarily have that factual basis to, uh, to say that these are the ones most closely uh, correlated. Um, and I think we've got a great opportunity to continue to uh, monitor what's actually happening through our inspection process, see what audit firms are talking with the audit committees about, as well as uh, our increasing uh, outreach and discussion with audit committees to find out what's most important to them and how are they, they using it. So I, I think... Uh, um, uh, personally, I'd like to see that effort continue, and, um, and I think we, we uh, hopefully will do that. Thanks, Jay. And Jeanette uh, Franzel put up her card as well. Yeah, my comments are going to be very consistent um, with Jay's. I'm actually going to be speaking on this topic uh, at Kansas University later this week. And so I spoke with our staff this week um, 
to see what activities are we currently doing in this area. And very consistent with uh, the direction that Jay has given, um, the staff are really encouraging experimentation with this. Um, they would like audit committees and the market and the firms to really think about this, try to link it to root cause. I'm very interested in seeing some of these be linked to our um, audit firm system of quality controls project because I think some of those process controls or AQIs would be very important for firms to use in their own internal monitoring. So we're trying to connect the dots here between several very important projects and uh, I think the staff are really in a research mode, monitoring mode and you know it will be quite some time before we can or would take any official action, but that's fine. I think that this is a, an area that's very ripe for significant development and significant study. And if we don't, I think if we don't see development happening out there, we might prod people along. Thanks. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, the next topic, uh, which is related to standard setting as well. But uh, we have mentioned in the past that. Uh, we were going through a standard setting process review and we thought it was given the role of the SAG to advising us on, on standard setting as you've been doing uh, throughout the day to, to give you an update on, on that process review and, and what we've been doing and what we learned and what improvements we're, we're making. So in early 2015, uh, the PCOB began a review of its standard setting process. The review was initiated primarily because of questions surrounding the pace of standard setting, not because of any questions at all regarding the quality of standards adopted by the board. Also, given the relatively young age of the organization, this is the right time to take a step back to assess how we're doing things and whether our processes could be enhanced. That's simply good practice to do that. Furthermore, both the Jobs Act of 2012 and the publication in 2014 of PCOB staff guidance on economic analysis and standard setting created significant changes that we have been incorporating into the standard setting process. We now make a separate analysis of our proposed rules for considerations of their applicability to audits of emerging growth companies, for instance. And we have significantly increased our focus, as was mentioned before by uh, Maureen McNichols, on deep economic analysis to support any rulemaking. So these factors significantly affected pace and further the need for a process review at this time. So during the past year, the PCOB board members and staff working with the consultant have assessed factors that may have been impacting pace at the PCOB, studied practices of other rulemakers, and through working groups and board, staff, consultant deliberations, developed a new framework for standard setting. In addition to considering processes of other rulemakers, the review process included consultation with investors and auditing, auditors, including members of the standard advisory group. Let me summarize uh, some of the key elements of improvements to the standard setting process. These include, among others, improved engagement throughout a standard setting project, including greater clarity among the divisions regarding their respective roles in the standard setting process, resulting in enhanced coordination among the divisions and improved engagement between the board and the office of the chief auditor in reaching key decisions throughout a standard setting project. Uh, also, greater integration of economic analysis in standard setting by consolidating and adding economists in the Center for Economic Analysis dedicated to supporting standard setting to foster solid economic analysis from beginning to end of a standard setting project. Some of our projects, um, really as we had the increased responsibilities and the, the staff guidance and economic analysis, really started to add in economic analysis as a project was already underway. This, this really imposes on us the team working together to perform economic analysis at the very front of a project to determine the need for that project and work with economists right through the very end of standard setting. And so that also results in more information gathering and analysis at the outset of a potential project to identify the problem to be solved. And also another improvement is a new process for adding projects to the PCOB's standard setting agenda, including greater outreach and research 
before topics are even added to the standard setting agenda. And finally, I think there's a better shared understanding regarding the standard setting process, including process flows, document, temp document templates and documents that need to be reviewed and prepared, roles and responsibilities of different parties, hands off, handoffs, and decision points. So let me discuss just one or two of these points in a bit more detail. And the first is work among divisions. Standard setting involves a coordinated effort by several divisions within the PCOB. Standard setting is not just done by the Office of the Chief Auditor. It, it involves significant coordinated effort by several divisions within the PCOB. Let me give some examples. The Office of the Chief Auditor has a primary responsibility for drafting standards and related release text for the board's consideration for proposals, reproposals, or adopting releases. In considering the need for these rulemakings, however, it is essential that OCA take into consideration observations from the board's inspections and enforcement activities. For example, what have those divisions seen in their oversight activities that contribute to, one, the identification of the problem to be solved, the need for standard setting, or, or practices by firms that we might want to consider? as we consider a potential proposal. Also, it is equally important for those oversight activities to provide input into and fully understand any related new rulemaking in connection with the board's deliberation. Next, given the legal stature of board rulings, the board's Office of General Counsel always carefully reviews and considers all aspects of any new rule and reports its findings to my office OCA and to the board. Also, the Office of the Chief Auditor must work closely with the Center for Economic Analysis and others to determine to, to comply with the staff guidance for economic analysis in PCOB standard setting. This includes addressing the need for rulemaking, the baseline for measuring rule impacts, including the regulatory baseline, as well as the baseline in practice, if different. Alternatives considered both in connection with whether rulemaking or increased inspection or enforcement is the right solution. And if rulemaking is the right solution, what are the alternatives to consider within the rulemaking? And fourth, the economic impacts of the rule, including costs and benefits. And so OCA, the Center for Economic Analysis, the Office of General Counsel, inspections and enforcement, among others, have to coordinate efforts carefully to complete any rulemaking. Our process changes enhance and facilitate this coordination, including the feedback loop between the oversight activities and standard setting. Now let me turn to the standard setting process itself. The enhanced standard setting process now has a clearer description of process flow and responsibilities and envisions four phases to standard setting very briefly as follows. In phase one, we seek to understand current and emerging audit issues, resulting in a list of issues to potentially research further. In this phase, an interdivisional team scans the environment, including conferring broadly with external thought leaders to identify the significant emerging audit issues for the board's consideration. The SAG, among others, contributes to this environmental scan and will do so today through your continuing discussion of emerging audit issues. So first of all, the very first thing in our phase one is to make sure we know what are the emerging audit issues that are most important, confer with existing and with external thought leaders, and discuss with the board those emerging audit issues to identify what are the most critical for us to pursue further. In phase, in phase two, for issues selected from phase one, based on research and outreach, we determine the problem to be solved, the potential need for rulemaking, and if potential rulemaking, alternative standard, setting, alternative standard setting solutions and their respective economic impacts. During this phase, select, selected topics will be added to a new PCOB research agenda. So we put projects historically on our standard setting agenda when there was still more research to be done about the problem to be solved. We understood that there was an issue. 
but whether that issue could best be solved via a practice alert, greater inspection, or through a proposal had not yet really be, been determined in some stages when an item got on the standard setting agenda. Thus, a long time before, while well, it was on the agenda, until it finally went to proposal because a lot of those efforts had to take place. So topics will now be added to this new research agenda, which would, they'd be studied, as I just described, to, dis, to decide whether they should ultimately be added to our standard setting agenda. So this phase contemplates extensive research and outreach, in con including potential use of board concept releases, staff consultation papers, or other outreach mechanisms. So again, a research agenda before something gets on a standard setting agenda. Sri, do you have a comment? Uh, this, is a, this is a question of uh, how to execute in the now while thinking about the future. That's the, that's the challenge here. And so uh, was there any thought given to having maybe an emerging issues task force that perhaps will be part of the SAG and every SAG meeting will have consideration of these topics, including potential cost benefit issues that may arise if such standards were to be contemplated, so how would we go about doing that? So I, I think that would be most helpful uh, to just keep track of you know, what's, what's coming and, and being prepared. That's a good recommendation and we'll certainly take that into account. Um, I, I will, we will talk later on today about current and emerging issues, which is a follow-on to the November discussion. I do think at every November meeting, I expect to ask a task force of the SAG months before the November meeting to develop what they say are, see as the current emerging audit issues and present that to the SAG at the November meeting for a thoughtful discussion and then we would follow on with that discussion throughout the year including at, a, at the next meeting in May or, or maybe at other meetings. But that's certainly something for us to take up to make sure that we are on top of all the emerging issues. And that's the purpose of this new phase one, to make sure that we're doing a good environmental scan and we are addressing the most important emerging audit issues. So thanks for that comment. Uh, in phase three, we, that's when we first add new topics to our standard setting agenda based on the research and outreach done and decisions made in phase two. Next in phase three, we use a multidisciplinary project team, as I said, we work together with inspections, general counsel, Center for Economic Analysis, as well as my, as well as my own office, to develop proposing releases based on the agreed upon problem statement, standard setting solution, and economic analysis performed in phase two. Because of the work done in phases one and two going forward, it is expected that once new projects are added to the standard setting agenda in the future, they would move far more expeditiously to board proposals in the future. And finally, in phase four, after consideration of comments received on a proposal, we resolve policy considerations, we refine solutions, and rules are adopted by the board uh, as appropriate. So each of these new phases, phases involves the work of multidisciplinary teams from multiple divisions of the PCIB, as well as regular meetings between the staff and the board in reaching and documented decisions. Um, I've discussed uh, several key changes to our standard setting process, but I want to reiterate two key points incorporating the participation of the SAG. Uh, as Sri just mentioned, one very important aspect of the change includes the environmental scan in phase one, but it's really a continuing uh, environmental scan to identify emerging issues that could be ultimately added to the new PCOB research agenda. The SAG plays a critical role in this phase and as just mentioned, we'll continue to do so today at the emerging issues discussion later. And second in phase two, which includes adding topics to the new research agenda and studying these matters, can also include increased outreach to SAG members and others regarding the need for rulemaking and potential solutions to problems identified before they're added to the PCOB standard setting agenda. So significant efforts by many have gone into our standard setting review. We are in the implementation phase and are excited about these process improvements which taken together and with other board activities 
should result in greater investor protection through improvements in audit quality and in the role and relevance of the audits. Interested in taking any further comments or questions about the standard setting process or any other matters that you might have about the standard setting update today? Uh, Brian Croto. Thanks, Marty. And um, I think just given this is an area that SEC staff, um, including myself, have expressed a degree of concern on in the past, uh, Chair White and, and, and some of our commissioners have expressed interest in, in, in seeing uh, looked at. Uh, I just wanted to commend the PCB staff on the work in this space. I think Marty uh, did a very nice job at teeing up what's been a long and extensive process that we were also from a staff perspective involved in. Uh, the comprehensive review, including the use of a consultant and, and significant outreach, I think has resulted, at least in my perspective, in um, an updated process that the proof will obviously be in the implementation, but I think uh, is significantly improved over, over past practices. Uh, I do believe it will result in more transparency, more ability for uh, SAG and other input along the way, more informed policy decisions by the time of a proposal, and uh, ultimately a lot less question about why something might be taking the length of time it is to, to get done. Some projects still might, might take a long time to research, but as Marty's mentioned, once a project is on the standard setting agenda, presumably being able to move that along more quickly. So um, certainly from, a, from an SEC staff perspective, from my own perspective, very supportive of the work that's been done here and, and we certainly look forward to working with the PCOB uh, as they advance uh, the implementation of this work. I think the discussion later today will be very important relative to the SAG's role. Obviously there would need to be some changes in how the SAG interacts uh, given the change in processes to the standard setting uh, processes and the phases that Marty's described, but wanted to just congratulate the PCOB staff. Brian, thanks for those comments, and uh, we appreciate the support of the SEC throughout this uh, process uh, to further enhance and uh, make improvements to the process, and uh, it's been very helpful and useful working together. And, uh, and again, much of what I said and what Brian said indicates uh, the importance of the input that we get from the SAG from these emerging issues discussions that will drive new standard setting initiatives and even that research initiatives first and then as we research those issues, greater outreach uh, to members of the SAG and others to decide whether a standard setting approach is appropriate and the direction that we take. So uh, your input will even be more valuable going forward. With, I'm sorry, uh, Phil Santorelli. Yeah, and Phil, you have a I have time for one more question after Phil and I think we're late for a break, but go ahead, Phil. I mean, just really briefly, uh, as being uh, a, uh, a participant in some of the outreach from staff with respect to the standard study, notably on estimates for value and specialists, uh, I would comment that it's a, 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 a vastly improved process. I think it's been working very, very well. Very good dialogue and the staff has been open to suggestions and listening and I think it's, it, that's a good, a good thing and, 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 a, and a break from where it was prior to. So I, I applaud the, the change. Well, thanks for the comment as well as for your participation in the outreach and we can't do it without the active uh, participation of you and others who are willing to, to work with us. So thanks a lot. I see no other cards up. Uh, that uh, ends the uh, morning session before the break. Break was scheduled at 10.30 to 11. It's uh, about, uh, why don't we try to get back here at uh, five minutes after 11. Thanks. <laughs>